So welcome everyone to this last but not least BIMSID presentation. So for the next uh, 45 minute hour or so, we're gonna talk about the Tara Oceans Expedition. And so just as last time, we wanted to take some moments. So like the ocean covers more than 70% of the Earth, Earth's surface, yet it's very unexplored and very unknown. So we wanted to first foster like a little debate about like why in the first place do we want to study and explore the ocean so if you guys want to jump in and and put some ideas either in the chat or live we can have a few of your inputs <laughs> or Siren says because it's here <laughs> it's there Wait, that's an interesting life. Uh -huh. Because life originated there. There are more ocean than earth. Yeah. Because ocean because, is yeah. money to beginning since evolution. It's resources to explore geology mm -hmm. because it buffers carbon. Interesting. What is the question? I just. <laughs> The question, so the question yeah go on and on the screen. why do we explore and study the oceans because it's infinite influences climate through streams it impacts okay. our terrestrial life ah really unknown part of, a, of our biosphere so most people are like going in in the direction <laughs> of uh, exploring the unknown and uh, and looking at uh, how it impacts the the climate and and the and yeah, discovering what's inside basically yeah and also some, some kind of economic are, yeah. yes. um, considerations it's very interesting food indeed mm -hmm. buried treasure <laughs> depends who you ask Anyways, so yeah, so now the rest of this presentation will be about um, our attempts to to understand how Tara um, revealed the ocean's mysteries. I was muted. Sorry. And to start uh, <laughs> things, we we wanted to show with you with this slide that the Tara expeditions are, are not our first attempts actually to try to understand what's going on in the oceans. Um, but it distinguishes itself. Um, I mean, you, you have two uh, distinctions that I would like to make is first that um, in the early years, the main objective of this expedition was not to look at oceans diversity or at climate change or or things like this. It was the main reason. Uh, reasons were economic, like finding new trade routes, or understanding how uh, streams were uh, in the oceans were occurring and where they were leading to improve the the navigation of the boats. And uh, also in the 19 years, um, sorry, in the 19th century, it was to carto to make a map of the ocean floor, because at that time they wanted to connect. Uh, America and Europe with uh, telegraph cables and so to know kind of where to put them and uh, and to have a better understanding of, of this ocean floor they, they did a cartography of it and so you had some naturalists on board that were looking at macroorganisms mainly because the microscopy techniques at, at the time were not so so developed and so which brings to the second point uh, the tools that were available so with more recent years uh, we have access to next generation sequencing and the high throughput imaging that allows to detect and, and observe many of the undetected organisms that were present in the oceans. Uh, for example, very important to, to, to uh, maybe to, to highlight is the Global Ocean Sampling Expedition that happened between 2004 and 2007. And this expedition was initiated by Craig Venter actually. And it's the first time they like did the, 
massive sequencing to look at the microbiome in the oceans. So yeah, that's uh, about our expeditions. Now let's see maybe what is it actually. Next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah. Next. So actually, when we say terra expedition, we should say terra expeditions because there are four different. The first one was a Tara Arctic that uh, spanned from 2006 to 2008, and it was its goal was to look at how climate change impacts the Arctic Ocean and the sea ice. Um, then the the expedition that we are interested in and on which we will focus is the Tara Oceans expedition, which looked at sampling planktonic life in all oceans. And then we had the Tara Mediterranean Mediterranean looking at plastic uh, yeah plastic pollution in the Mediterranean Sea and the Terra Pacific that was looking at coral reefs. And uh, we wanted also to show you on the next slide, uh, yeah, the kind of the timeline of the papers we read for you. Uh, so you can see that um, they span from 2015 to 2019, 2015, like two years after the end of Terra Ocean's expedition. And uh, interestingly, you have a special issue in science that was published with a lot of papers like dedicated to Terra Oceans papers. And the papers that were published here kind of paved the way or uh, introduced uh, to the, the, um, the research or the exploration of, uh, of the data that was generated during Terra Oceans. On next slide, we would like also to show you um, like the, the distribution of the publication over the years and also to show you that uh, among the 15, like we read only 15 papers, it's like 10% a bit more than all the papers that are published currently. So it's also kind of a, a, a it's not an exhaustive presentation of all what was done uh, during Terra Oceans and it's not possible to, to achieve such things. Next slide, please. Right. So a bit more on Terra Oceans, what it is and where it, where it went. So um, just to, to sum up the, the outline of our presentation, so we're going to introduce like Terra and what it is and all the methods for sampling and handling the, um, the, the samples. And then discoveries going from the more generic to the more specific and then our inputs on limitations and, and conclusions. So the objectives of Terra Oceans in the first place was to collect, sample, and quantify plankton communities. So it's, in their own word, a unique sampling program that uh, uses optical and genomic methods to describe life, uh, like micro life in the ocean, as well as their environment. And so basically the questions we're gonna answer in our presentation is what is there, what do they do, and how do they interact? So also one of the questions is like, why study plankton in the first place and not bigger organisms? So because they're the foundation of the ocean food web. So like some of you kind of um, highlighted this in your answers earlier. So they're the carbon entry point in the ocean. A lot of the planktons uh, do photosynthesis. So they are responsible for half, if not more, of the production of O2 in the, in the atmosphere. And they fixate carbon a lot. So they have a tremendous impact on uh, climate and also the, the whole food web in and out of the oceans. Uh, they're main actors in climate regulation. Uh, they have a lot, like a very, very high richness in genetic potential that we do not know anything about. And that's also why we chose this project. Um, so Tara, uh, in a few figures, so the itinerary is, as you can see on this map, uh, it starts in France and ends in France in uh, Lorient. And so you can see like if you follow first the, the pink, reddish, and then yellow, then white, then red, deep uh, red lines, you can see the itinerary. So they stopped in two, like they sampled 210 stations. And when we say station is like a geographic place, but they did more than one sample per station. So they have over 35, 5,000 samples and then you'll so we'll introduce this um, this concept of pelagic zones so a pelagic zone is a zone in the ocean that is defined by its depth so the the first one is the epipelagic is where the sun there's a like the sun reaches first and then mesopelagic batipelagic and so Tara did not sample anything below the batipelagic point 
And there's also an interesting um, and, and crucial point that we want to come across is the deep chlorophyll level, which is not a pelagic zone because it, it's basically the level below surface water at which the chlorophyll concentration is maximum. So the, it's very highly linked to the amount of food uh, that you can find in this zone. And so it varies from zone to zone. Um, and the way to find it is that they use probes and, and they measured where it was. And so you will find it uh, at different depths depending on where you are in the ocean. Um, and so Tara, in answer to some of your questions on the, on the forum, did not go into fresh waters, uh, nor rivers, lakes, whatever, just the ocean uh, in the itinerary we showed. So then um, sampling and methodology, which will be introduced by Divya. Yeah, so next slide, please. Next, yeah. So an important aspect of Tara is this really interesting boat. It's called the Schooner and it's a lightweight boat where they had the uh, entire wet lab and dry lab component on the boat itself and uh, hundreds of scientists all over the world. So it's a very big, huge international expedition. Um, and uh, it also had, con they also had continuous surface sampling system where they actually took data continuously. They pumped data into the, uh, they uh, collected water uh, immediately from the ocean and uh, purified it and stored samples on boat itself. And everything was well planned and executed because uh, it was away from the, uh, if you had to go back to the shore again, it would take long time. So it was a very well executed uh, expedition. Uh, yeah. So this is like a quick chart to uh, to uh, introduce how samples were collected. So they uh, to begin with, they collected really small things from viruses to really big things uh, uh, like zooplanktons. And Jiris is basically large virus. And then they had they collected bacteria and protists. So the way they did it is they would just dunk in one large sample, one large uh, uh, one large bot bottle or uh, bag that would collect huge amount of water from which all these organisms were uh, uh, extracted independently. Like for instance, you would use miskin bottles to extract viruses. You'd, they would use filtration methods to uh, extract virus and bacteria. And they would use nets of different mesh sizes to uh, uh, isolate protists and zooplanktons. Uh, the next one. So uh, an, another important component of the expedi uh, expedition is sample storage. So they did cryopreservation of all the samples. So all samples were stored before they were sent for sequencing or further analysis. And uh, so, okay, so this is a very important component as well of the expedition where they, uh, which is the basis of a lot of results that we are going to show in the coming slides. So they did high throughput sequencing for a lot of samples that were collected and metagenomic data was extracted. So for prokaryotes, 16S DNA and RNA was extracted and for eukaryotes, 18S was extracted and uh, sequenced. And, for, and they also did high throughput imaging, like they did flow cytometry and uh, fluorescent microscopy and other types of microscopy to actually visual, visualize organisms that have never been uh, seen before in the ocean. And they also used other techniques like flow cam and zoo scan to look at organisms uh, and uh, visualize them. Uh, next slide. Yeah, so just uh, to quickly uh, recap, so 16S and 18S are uh, two components uh, uh, both relate to a part of ribosomal RNA and their slow mutation rate actually makes them suitable for evolutionary and phylogenetic studies. So since they mutated a really slow rate, a lot of organisms have similar 16S and 18S sequences like uh, I mean for prokaryotes is 16S and for eukaryotes is 18S. So you can actually if you sequence this part of the uh, genome then you can actually reconstruct the phylogenetic tree. So this was done a lot of uh, things. Now, uh, Nicola will uh, quickly talk about uh, the data collection and uh, the database for Tara Oceans. Yeah. Um, so what we wanted to, to show with, yeah. So Nicola, before you go further, I think Sirin wa wanted to ask a question and also we have Santa and Swing3 uh, commenting. Okay. Uh, yeah, my question was really simple. It, it was about like, because you were saying that all those methods were used in the boat and that there were hundreds of scientists. I think I didn't imagine how big the boat was. Do you have some insight? So the boat is actually not that big. Uh, it's just that uh, scientists would not spend the full, like there was no single scientist that spent, I think the, the full like three, four years there. 
they they had a, a turnover yeah so it's I like i think it's 16 meters long if yeah, i and also so they had multiple stations at which they would halt so people would get in and get off at different stations so can i answer that uh, npr or not yeah, yeah yes. go for it so uh, hi my name is flora and i was actually a scientist on tara and to give you an idea we are maximum 16 on the boat uh, it's always seven scientists uh, in general, there is uh, five sailors, one cook, one journalist, and one artist. And the boat is uh, 10 meters large, it's uh, 36 meters long, yeah, and it's 36. 27 meters high. So it's quite a big boat, and it's around 189 tons. So it's not so light, but it's very unusual to have a sailing boat as a scientific boat. Yeah, okay. Thanks. And Swing 3, and Santa, do you, wanna, do, you, do you want to comment, to ask a question? What you put on chat? Uh, yeah, I would like to go ahead. Um, so my question was regarding. Uh, so you you said that you don't, and I read that paper as well that uh, the expedition does not go beyond the pathetic zone. But I would want to understand why is that? Because in my knowledge, wouldn't that be very rich in fossils and would be able to give us much more information and details into evolution? Um, maybe I can try to, to answer that. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yes, definitely, bathypelagic uh, and abyssopelagic uh, studies uh, are, are interesting, mm -hmm. um, but it becomes harder to, to like have an exhaustive sampling of it since it's very, uh, like it's, it's much, much deeper than, oh. uh, than the other uh, pelagic zones. But uh, yes, you're right, like you have sedimentation, and so yeah. you can think that um, on the ocean floor you'd have s several um, um, sediment uh, zones, and that each zone could refer to as another time point uh, in the ocean history, like, I mean, the, in the history of organisms in the ocean. Yes, exactly. So you, you're saying that it's because sampling would be difficult in those zones, is it? Yeah, yeah, I okay. think it's more difficult to do it. That's why it's, I think some people have done it uh, because we have information, for example, um, about some uh, microbial communities that are actually in the sediments in the abyssal uh, regions. Okay. Uh, but uh, I don't think it's, it's like we had an exhaustive, uh, we don't have an exhaustive uh, exp exploration of, of this. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Um, hi. Yes. Hi. Uh, I just had a very practical question. Uh, to my understanding, cryopreservation is with uh, solid carbon dioxide or liquid nitrogen. And uh, previously, Divya mentioned that uh, the storage was made because the land was just so far off. So I was just wondering uh, how then they got uh, the the uh, solid carbon dioxide or liquid nitrogen there. But I guess this question was already answered with Sirin's question that they had multiple stops. Yeah, that and also, so from what I read, it was not very clear uh, as to wh when they used this, but I also read that they did uh, both ethanol preservation and formaldehyde preservation. So I, I'm not sure if, if they used cryopreservation throughout. So. Laura, do you want to help us here? Uh, yeah, so regarding the first question about liter nitrogen, so there were two tanks of, uh, I think, 100 liters. Of liquid nitrogen and that in general was enough to cryopreserve samples for two weeks and the boat would never be offshore for more than two weeks because you have to cook for 16 people so in general after two weeks you anyhow need to stop on an island so in those situations you would send all the samples get new refill of liquid nitrogen so you just needed liquid nitrogen for two weeks and regarding the Lugol and formal and ethanol, so no formal preservation on the boat, but Lugol and ethanol preservation was performed for all the samples of the above 20 micron for all the stations. Uh, and this were also shipped uh, regularly because otherwise it would take too much uh, space. So overall, every two to three weeks, you had a, a shipment and rotation of teams also that would enable to empty the freezers, empty the liquid nitrogen. Okay, thank you. Thank you. More mm. question or we continue? Maybe last question of Shibu. Uh, 
so uh, I wanted to know, I mean, this 16S RNA sequencing, do you do it also for viruses? And if yes, how? Um, so you want to do it, Sadidia, or? No, go ahead. Right. <laughs> uh, well, for 16S, since it's a ribosomal uh, RNA, you, yeah. viruses do not uh, synthesize their, their ribosomes. Yes. So you... How, do, how do you do it for these viruses in that so what I've read is that uh, you look at other things like uh, the capsid proteins of viruses uh, okay. or, or other stuff. But it's a, it's a very interesting question because um, people say that it's very tricky to determine what is a viral species and like what's a, uh, and to construct phylogenetic trees of viruses because they evolve quite a lot, and we don't have such a good uh, genetical genetic distance marker as we do uh, yes. for prokaryotes and eukaryotes with, uh, with B16S and 18S. Yeah. Actually, in one of the papers that we decided not to present, uh, they decided to map uh, various families into the amount of horizontal gene transfer like that okay. they could find. So they used different techniques, but it's a, a very interesting and relevant question of like, how do you determine uh, like phylogeny of viruses? Um, but no, so there's no 16 or 18s uh, sequencing for yeah. for okay. virus. Uh, and then in that case, I mean, what do you check? Just the caspid, is it, or what do you what do you do to? I mean, what what have they done? Otherwise, but I guess you can still sequence the genome that I mean, is in there. Yeah. yeah. Like they didn't stop at 16 or 18s sequencing. It's just that there, it's the most okay. uh, used tool to to find out phylogenetic trees due to the low mutation rate. Okay. Cool. So back to databases. Um, back to databases. So um, the idea was um, yes. So that we have a lot of samples. Uh, with a lot of reads and, and uh, of sequencing reads. And so if you want to use them, we need to store them somewhere and to make them accessible. And so you have several databases that got fed with the Tara Ocean data, uh, namely two very important ones, which are the OMRGC, which stands for um, Ocean Microbial Reference Gene Catalog. And it's a database that is constructed by the joint uh, data from the GOS expedition that I was mentioning earlier and the Tara Oceans expedition. And it regroups for around 40 million of non-redundant genes of prokaryotes, mostly prokaryotes, uh, prokaryotic genes. Uh, another interesting database is the MATU database, which stands for Marine Atlas of Tara Oceans Unigenes. And it comprises 160 million uh, eukaryotic uh, unigenes. And uh, this data set was constructed, constructed mainly from transcriptomics. And so it's uh, genes coding for, for proteins. And uh, lastly, it's the Pangaea uh, database uh, where all the environmental parameters are, are uh, were stored uh, that are linked to, to each sample. And so on the next slide, uh, it's, a, it's a good question that, um, yeah. And for some reason, I can't skip slides anymore. But keep going and I'll find okay. it. Okay, so it was a good question of, of Senta. Uh, her question was like, how do you uh, make sure that in the end, the sampling that you've done is representative of, um, of, uh, of, of the diversity in the, in the ocean? Like how do you make sure that all the sequences that you have in your database are in the end representative enough of, uh, of the diversity. And so to answer this question, um, they did rarefaction curves, where basically they were taking a sample from a station, looking at all the genes that were uh, inside, and then adding the genes coming from another sample. And they were looking at the enrichment of genes, so how many new genes that were not in the previous sample were, were observed. And so for the OMRGC database, you can see that the enrichment of new genes uh, grows rapidly until like the 50th sample. And then it kind of decays in the number of new genes. 
and even reaching kind of a, a plateau. And so this, they, they make like the, the strong, uh, but very, I, I mean, I like what they're saying is that a statement that um, if you sampled like 2000 samples instead of 250, you'd not see so much new genes uh, appear. Uh, occur so so they say that they have actually achieved a quite well sampling of, of the diversity of genes for uh, for for prokaryotes and the, in the small subgraph that you can see so in black it's still the 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 genes for the omrgc uh, and in pink it's the um, the rarefaction curve for um, gut microbiome and it was just to show that the number of genes, of unique genes uh, in the oceans is, is much higher than the, the number of genes in the, in the gut. Uh, if you go next slide, uh, they did the same thing for the MATU database. So looking at uh, the transcriptomal eukaryotic, uh, I mean the, the coding genes of eukaryotes. And so in green, you have actually the, the curve of the OMRGC database. So it's the one on, on the left. And in red, it's the, uh, so the, the genes uh, from the MATU database. And what you can see is that you have much more genes from eukaryotic genes than prokaryotic genes. But also, even if the sampling effort was gigantic, um, they did not reach yet like the, the saturation points. So you still have, they, they, they predicted that the, the kind of the, number of total genes in the in the ocean for eukaryotes uh I mean, coding genes for eukaryotes is around 170 uh, millions of genes and right now there are around 120 around 160. yeah so other question on on on, uh, on next slide is how to use these databases and uh, for that they made a, a web server called the ocean gene atlas which is very cool, very interesting, because you don't require a lot of bioinformatics skills to use it. And basically what you'll do is you'll take a, a sequence that you are, are interested in and you'll uh, input it in the web server and you'll do a blast search in the different uh, databases available to find where your uh, sequence of interest is located on the, on the globe, on, on, in the oceans, how much abundant it was, so how many reads are retrieved for, for this sequence, and what are the environmental parameters that are associated with the um, with the locations uh, where where your your sequence was found was found? And so uh, we're not going to present you right now uh, how to to use this website. We'll do it later in the presentation. But uh, but yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> so then, like on to the the main. Um, now that we've uh, passed the method um, part of the presentation. So the first question is, what is in the ocean? So looking at uh, taxonomy and diversity and how it's spread around in the ocean. So again, like some, some background, uh, one of the measures that was used a lot in the articles was the operational taxonomy units or the OTUs. And in many cases as well, the MOTUs, so molecular uh, operational taxonomy units. And they're basically like, a way to classify groups of related individuals. So you belong to an OTU if you pass a certain threshold of similarity um, that make you uh, closer to like, like the same entity and that's um, into units. And so like when you look at the abundance, so this is a, a graph um, from a paper that relates to uh, prokaryotes in the ocean. And so they looked at the abundance and richness of um, OTUs in different places in the ocean. Um, and so the, the distinction between abundance and richness is that you can have um, a high proportion, um, like it's, you can, you can have a high proportion of some individuals and then uh, but the, the rest, the smaller fraction, be a very, very diverse um, uh, group. So, um, like, uh, here, you can see that um, in different, uh, so they measured in the surface, uh, deep chlorophyll um, maximum and mesopelagic um, levels. And in all three of them, um, 
they looked at the abundance and richness of different taxonomy units. And interestingly, they find some other phyla and, and unclassified um, bacteria. So like that shows that there's still quite a bit of an unknown. And this trend deeps, deepens with the eukaryotes. So in the eukaryotes, one third, oh wait, we have a lot of questions, so I think we'll take. Um, so, um, all right, uh, so what we mean by abundance and richness in terms of OTU. Um, so like here we, we can have quite like, so here is the number of reads in the, the A part, uh, the, the top part, abundance. The number of reads, so you can find that um, you have like a lot, a high proportion of um, OPs, like uh, OP still conta. Um, but then, um, so they represent like if you look at the number, the sheer amount of them, you will find that they come to a, a maximum, like they're a majority of the reads. But then, uh, if you look at the diversity uh, in the same sample, you can find that there is a higher diversity than just like the majority of reads would show you. And in that higher diversity of genes that we didn't know about, a lot of them are either unassigned or undetermined. So, this like in this slide, one like in this study, they showed that one third of eukaryotes had unmatched operational taxonomy units. So um, like we don't know uh, one third of the diversity of eukaryotes uh, in the ocean, which is kind of one of the big uh, take home message for Tara is that we like, we discovered a lot of um, richness in the ocean that was completely under the scientists radar uh, before Tara. And then we can also see, wait, I can't again. Um, that's the next slide. Um, uh, Maybe you click on, on your screen. Oh yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> we see the same um, trend with virus. So here on this graph, um, you have the number of stations um, in abscess and the abundance um, on the, on the, the y-axis. And so, like this, this graph shows you the the number of virus that you could find in twenty five, like in in how many numbers of stations. Um, so, like the more to the right you go, the more you could find this number of virus um, in many different places in the ocean. And so we can see that virus, like there is a very high diversity in very localized places, um, which is quite cool. And then actually, like um, in the known the known virus uh, prior to Tara expeditions, are just under ten percent of the total number of uh, viral like genomes that were sampled. Um, and so that's kind of a tremendous amount of things that we didn't know about in the ocean. And it also highlights the point that you can still classify, like you can still cluster OTUs together, even if you don't know them. So that's a, an important point to remember. And now we're gonna also introduce a different, like a theoretical background point, which is the latitude diversity gradient. So it's the idea that also exists on land that uh, diversity in ecosystems increase as you go closer to the equator. And that's linked to a, a high number of uh, parameters. So there is no clear consensus of why this trend exists. But we found a paper that tried to confirm or infirm that trend in the oceans. And so the, the measure they used was the Shannon Diversity Index. So the like Shannon's Diversity Index, it re relates to diversity. So, um, like the higher the, it's like it's a combination of richness and also like the probability of finding um, the same um, the same OTU or the same the same event. Um, so as you can see, like in those little boxes, um, even though there are two only two colors. Uh, the Shannon's diversity incre will increase 
if the, those colors are in equal proportions. Um, so, like the, it's also like used in machine learning algorithm to mine texts, interestingly enough. Uh, and it's quite a straightforward indicator because it relates linearly to diversity. But the downside of it is that it undermines small proportions um, that are more sensible also to sampling effects. And so looking back at how diversity uh, in the oceans is uh, following the, the latitudinal diversity gradient, um, the, the Iberbals and Al paper, it showed that prokaryotes and eukaryotes tend to follow the latitude diversity gradient and virus not so much. So the diversity of some virus was more, uh, was increased in the northern hemisphere as you go closer to colder uh, temperature and closer to the poles. And they wanted to see like the drivers of diversity. So they had this figure, which is not super intuitive, but if you look at it, like in the, um, in the bottom part, they have a lot of different drivers of, of diversity. So absolute latitude, temperature, the amount of certain nutrients. And then they, they looked at the correlation between those possible drivers. So the very top part of the figure. The dendrogram will show you like the, um, how close parameters are to each other. And then they related that to um, whether it was positively or, or negatively correlated with the diversity of different uh, bacteria, protists, or, or viruses. And they saw that some of what explained the diversity was um, like temperature was the best predictor of how diverse a sample would be. And then the availability of food source was also a good predictor. And um, they had a, a lower um, predictive uh, power as they went deeper because there were like more food, food sources, uh, like a higher diversity of food sources. And also like the temperature differences were a bit less striking, even though they still existed. And then using that, um, those conclusions, they looked at how that would affect our like the diversity in light of climate change. So they did simulations uh, based on the a database from the climate research program and the coupled model inter um, comparison. So this like database had a few different scenarios of what would happen to our climates in the next hundred years, and they using thirty five parameters they did thirteen hundred models that they averaged out um, to make predictions of how diversity would be affected by the, the climate change. And what they saw was that uh, there would be an increased diversity, especially in the Northern Hemisphere. And actually the Arctic Oceans would see their diversity double. Um, and of course, like that will have uh, effects that we cannot predict on um, like, how that will affect fisheries and also like bio geochemical um, environment in general. And then um, one also interesting um, point from a different article um, on the gene expression and, and how they're affected by temperature is that they wanted to see if the gene expression that was sampled was due to different populations or just a difference in expression of those populations. And they looked, they saw that as you go uh, closer to the, to the equator, it's more um, a difference in expression of the same population. Uh, like you would have a, a, a higher diversity, like um, um, a higher change in the, the expression of the genes. And as you go closer to the poles, it's more um, the turnover. So like the, the different populations that would express different genes. So that's also a transition to like, now that we kind of know what is in the ocean, what do they do? Like, what are the genes expressed and what are their purpose, which Nicola will talk about. Yes, and um, I will also try maybe to answer Manuel's uh, question at the same time during the presentation. So what uh, Anpia presented is that we know how, uh, if you go next slide, we know how, um, or we have like a classification of, of the different uh, species 
we observed uh, in the samples. And indeed, this was uh, this taxonomical classification was used with, uh, using the 16S um, RNA sequences. Um, and the 16S RNA DNA sequences. And, uh, and uh, okay, this is what we know, but then if you look at the genes, indeed, we, we cannot for sure, uh, I, I mean, we cannot attribute a gene to an organism if we don't have in our database, like a, a, a gene that would be closely related and for which we already know to which organism it belongs. And that's why if uh, for prokaryotes, we have like 10% of species or of 16S uh, sequences that could not, that we couldn't um, attribute to, to known species. But if we look at like genes in themselves, uh, there is like 50%, if you look at the graph on, on the left, you see that uh, you have uh, bar plots for different uh, oceans. So MS is Mediterranean Sea, RS is Red Sea, EO is Indian Ocean, etc., etc. And if you look at the mean, you see that in the surface, there is half of the genes that are completely novel genes that were not, uh, that are not matching any uh, gene in our databases. Uh, and for the deep chlorophylla maximum, it's, a, oops, sorry, can you go back? Yeah. For the deep chlorophylla maximum. Wait, sorry. That's okay. <laughs> uh, for the deep chlor uh, chlorophyll maxima, it's, uh, it's a bit more. And if you look at the mesopelagic uh, zone, we, we like know about 10%, 10% of the genes that were retrieved from there had a match in, in our uh, databases. So yes, there's a lot of new genes that we don't know at all to who they belong and uh, what they are doing. Uh, yeah, next slide, please. Maybe and should we should we should we make a pause here because uh, I think Shuk has a question and then maybe Manuel as well. Uh, I, yeah, I think I answered Manuel's question. Maybe you can tell but, me. Uh, it was clear. Ah, you. Manuel. Right. He's maybe gone. I don't know. Okay, Shubham, do you want to ask your question? We don't hear him. Yeah, but maybe I can. I can. So the question is, so where the verification curve that just for these diversity drivers? Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm reading it and I'm not sure to understand what you yeah. mean. Yeah, Shubham, could you explain a bit your question? Okay, we don't have Shubham. Well, let's continue. All right. Um. Okay, so let's let's see now what we let's try to to let, uh, say something about the the genes we know about. Um, so this figure, it's uh, it shows um, different uh, PFAMs. So PFAMs are protein families, and it's a bit like uh, OTUs, where it's just a group of proteins of uh, that are similar similar enough in sequence which leads to uh, like a similar protein domains in the protein and so similar functions. So like uh, if you look at the PFAM uh, ketin, ketin binding four, ketin bind four, uh, it, you have many different sequences that would more or less uh, be, be, be similar and thus have a similar function. And so what they did here, they looked at where uh, the, um, the proteins were the mostly expressed in uh, the size fraction. So you have the size fraction distribution where you see that, for example, again, this ketin binding uh, four is not at all present in the, sole, in the small fraction size, but it's rather like uh, in the above uh, five uh, micrometer fraction size uh, organisms. Uh, but also more interestingly, personally, I, th I, th I find it more interesting is um, who are the species that express uh, this um, these proteins and um, and uh, for example let's try another one um, like bacterial bacrodopsin yeah no not, not, let's not try another one <laughs> <laughs> uh, so for ketin binding four we see that it's uh, almost like 75% of, of the of the proteins uh, was uh, expressed by copepoda uh, the, the copepoda taxonomic group 
and uh, and yes, and Copepoda are zooplankton's, and they have like a, an outer shell and stuff. Um, and now is the time when we wanted to, to show you maybe how to use the OGA, so the Ocean Gene Atlas web server, upon Victor's re request. So basically how you would do it is uh, you, you, you have a sequence you're interested in. So you paste it inside the query, either, uh, the query sequence. Uh, you select if you wanted to search for a protein or a nucleotide. Uh, can you just go back? Yeah. Oh, no, it's not. Hey. Okay. You just like put a job title to, to be able to retrieve it and, and you ask for which database you want to look for. And then, uh, so it will search in the database and will retrieve you uh, on next, on next, uh, on next slide, sorry. It will retrieve you where it was found, in, in which oceans, at which sampling station, and uh, in how, what is the abundance, like uh, how much of it were retrieved. And so here I, um, I selected for you the surface uh, zone and the size fraction I selected is 0 to 0 0.22 micrometers and then uh, from 0 0.22 to 3 micrometers size fraction because it was the ones where the, the, um, the abundance was the highest. And what we can see is that uh, a lot of, like main, most of it is located in the Mediterranean Sea with a bit that is in like the north, uh, the west part of the uh, Atlantic Ocean. So yeah, you are able to retrieve this kind of information, but uh, very interestingly also on next slide, you are able to see how um, the, the, the presence of this uh, protein is correlated to uh, environmental parameters. And so for example, here I'm just selecting one uh, for, for you. It's the phosphate, uh, the, the abundance of phosphate in the environment. And we can see that uh, most of the proteins are, were sampled in regions where the amount of phosphor was very low. And actually it makes sense in the light of the function of the, of the protein, which is like a, a phospholipase. Um, and it's a protein that is being used by, uh, by bacteria, bacteria to uh, synthesize lipids uh, with, when uh, phospho, uh, phosphorus is not present. So when basically they cannot synthesize phospholipids. So it's kind of a, a, a an essential protein for the metabolic pathway of uh, lipid synthesis in low phosphorus uh, environment. And so this was like the case study, sorry, just the, this was the case study, but you can imagine that you can do the uh, reverse work where you don't know about the function of the, of, the, of the protein, of the gene, and by looking at finding like in which locations it's found and what are the correlations with the environmental parameters, try to, um, predict or, or to, to have a, a, some clues about its potential function. It's a very hard work to do because you have many things that are correlated together, but uh, it's like a, a first, at least uh, it's one of the tools you can use to, to have access to this information. And uh, one last thing they wanted to, to look at uh, is um, to compare uh, the, the genes the functional genes, uh, the, the coding genes that were found in the oceans with the uh, coding genes that are found in the gut microbiome and just to see if you have overlaps. Um, and they, they found that uh, you have, you do have some overlaps uh, and uh, it's, it's just, so we wanted to talk about this because we found it very interesting to make uh, this, um, this comparison at first, like why would you compare the ocean uh, microbiome and the gut microbiome? But in the end, the results that they, they, they obtained are kind of um, expected because the, the, the genes that were in this core, I mean, that are shared between ocean and gut are essential uh, genes for like uh, the main metabolic pathways of, uh, of bacteria. Um, like, uh, yeah, lipid synthesis, uh, um, DNA interaction proteins and uh, and metabolites synthesis, anyway, things that are in the end common to uh, both bacteria, no matter if they are in the ocean or in the guts. And uh, yes, so uh, this was kind of the explanation of uh, who are the organisms and what do they do. But uh, we should keep in mind that they are not alone, like in this uh, ocean, they are all together uh, 
uh, in co-presence and uh, Divya is going to talk to you how do they interact or to show you how we study their interaction. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so th this, so basically just to give a quick background of uh, the quick background and a recap till now we spoke about uh, things that were in community and about la about large scale discoveries, but they Tara was not just limited to that. They also did individual species discoveries and they just looked at one particular species and the interaction between two species and things like that. So very individual level kind of study. So this is a specific case study from this paper of uh, Solen et al, where they look at this, where they actually first in the beginning discovered a new ciliate species and then they look at photosymbiosis. So photosymbiosis is photosynthesis plus symbiosis. So uh, one of the organism in that uh, is basically photosynthetic and the other one is uh, 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 providing it uh, shelter or something like that. So here we talk about these two species. One is a symbiodenum species, which is a dinoflagellate, which is the symbiont, and that is photosynthetic. And the other one is that was discovered is this tiarina, it belongs to the tiarina genus, and uh, they discovered this this uh, new species, uh, uh, which was close to Tiarina fucus, and it is a ciliate protist, and it basically provided uh, uh, the symbiont uh, microenvironment to uh, live. Next slide. Uh, so yeah, so one some of the interesting results of this paper are basically uh, uh, initially because they discovered a new ciliate organism, they wanted to see how it looks. So a lot of electron microscopy. So the first two images are basically electron microscopy images of this particular ciliate that was discovered. And the later images are where they actually did layer, uh, layer dissection and taking images of different layers and reconstructing it to get a 3D image. So if you can see in image E, you have the host and within which you have the nucleus, which is the big blob. And then around which you have a different uh, uh, symbionts, which is the dinoflagellates floating in it and uh, um, reproducing. The next one. So after which, what they did is they also did they reconstructed the phylogenetic tree using the using uh, 18s uh, sequence, and uh, what they actually found was uh, they uh, they mapped this onto the uh, original original phylogenetic tree of this of this uh, ciliate spe ciliate genus, and they found that this particular species that they discovered was very close to. Uh, Tiarina fucus, uh, fucus uh, species, but not exactly the same. It was different by 11 nucleotides. Um, and, they, and they also found that this particular species that they discovered had two different types of genotypes. And they also tried to map using what Nicola showed earlier, the geographic location of these particular species that was, di that was discovered. The next slide. Yeah, and they do the same thing for uh, the symbiont, which was the dinoflagellate. But here, uh, something worth noting is that they, uh, so these one, the phylogenetic tree that is shown here has been actually constructed, has been constructed for those uh, symbionts that were extracted from the host to see if there is a correlation or not. So on the right hand side, if you see, those are actually the labels. Uh, the labels are actually IDs of the uh, the symbiodenum. So uh, they then they made this phylogenetic tree to see if there is any uh, communication between the symbiodenum species and the Tiarina species that was uh, newly discovered. Uh, yeah. So this in this. Uh, slide what they uh, uh, try to do is to actually geographically map the location of these two genotypes in the uh, in in the ocean map so on the left hand side in a you have the genotype 1 being mapped and on b you have genotype 2 of this newly discovered tiarina species mapped and they also try to do this correlation like similar to what nicola showed earlier between these two genotypes of the tiarina species and the symbiodenum species to see if you can actually uh, uh, if there is a positive or a negative correlation between different environmental factors uh, and the like, and and the depth of ocean and salinity and things like that, with the uh, abundance and uh, presence of these species. If so, are they present together or not? Uh, then, yeah. So okay, Tara is not just genomics. 
uh, till now we saw a lot of genomics, but it is also uh, a lot of microscopy and imaging work that they did to see, to study interaction between organisms. So here is this really specific case of uh, a paper where they look at uh, tintinid and uh, pennid diatoms. So the tintinid is the one that is there out. Uh, in the outer layer that basically is hard has a hard shell and gives protection and the one inside that is uh, the pe is the pennate diatoms which actually helps in motility and they are found to be living together in the ocean and this was actually discovered uh, mostly by doing confocal and electron uh, scanning microscopy uh, and uh, yeah, now uh, we will quickly conclude. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, it was the, sorry, it was the other way around. I I think I made a mistake. But, uh, now we will quickly conclude uh, talking about the limitations of the uh, expedition. Yeah. So um, just quickly to to kind of uh, address some of the limitations that uh, the 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 scientists uh, involved in the Terrestrial expedition are, are kind of aware of. But they're definitely aware of. Uh, first one, very important, is the fact that they sampled only one time point. So the boat was uh, making the itinerary, and so they did not stuck in a specific location to take samples at different time. Uh, and so it limits uh, the, the data in the sense that you cannot ask any question. So if you want to ask question about the evolutions or the population dynamics, you cannot because uh, we don't have information actually on, on what's going on after, I mean, around these time points. Uh, another point that uh, is not necessarily a limitation, but it was a huge critic from the scientific community, is that uh, the Tara Ocean expedition was not organized around a scientific question or a hypothesis that they wanted to test, like a specific hypothesis they wanted to test but it was more to look at the diversity of plankton um, and their distribution in the oceans. And so, yeah, it was criticized for that, but on the other hand, it was for, because of this that they did this holistic sampling and very exhaustive sampling that is now allowing us to have this huge data set to, to ask. Uh, and when we were reading some papers, we, we, so we found some possibly Contradictions, maybe not direct, but uh, it's it's, but some kind of uh, interpretations that we had of the results in the papers were sometimes contradicting uh, between each other, and uh, for us it was kind of showing that uh, there is still a lot of unknown and mystery around the oceans, and that people are trying to, to 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 reveal uh, or to discover uh, what's actually happening, and they all have their kind of favorite hypothesis that. They're testing or they're trying out, and uh, that's just a, a field in expansion, and uh, and uh, that is kind of um, yeah, contradicting itself, but uh, it's it's not an issue in the research. And the final point that is very important to note is that the results that we showed in this presentation, they are um, they are biased or they depend a lot on the current bioinformatic tools. Uh, and trends that are being used. For example, for the generation of OTUs, um, we're using, people are using a 97% similarity threshold. But you can imagine that if you change this uh, similarity threshold, it will change how many different OTUs you see. Because if you are 99% of similarity, you'll have much more different um, OTUs, but of smaller size. And then you'd say, okay, we have much, much more uh, species, so much uh, higher diversity in the end. So yeah, it, it's something that we should uh, keep in mind. And uh, so to finish, uh, kind of to wrap up all the things that we said. So what to remember from this presentation? First uh, is that uh, this Tara expedition um, did a lot of work to, 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 to make um, huge databases that are open in open access to study marine genes and marine populations. Um, and they asked uh, several questions. For example, they looked at the diversity in the oceans and they found out that it was in accordance with the latitude uh, diversity gradient hypothesis. Uh, they were able also to um, classify some, uh, some of the 16S, some of the species they found, but you, we still have many species to, to, to learn about and to, to classify for just some few numbers, 10% of prokaryotes, 30% of eukaryotes, and 90% of viruses. 
of the viruses uh, of the sequences found. They also tried to predict the impact of climate change on, on plankton communities. Um, and uh, they tried to look at uh, specific genes. And uh, basically the message to, to remember from that is that uh, there are so many genes that we don't know about what they're doing or to who they belong to. And it will be a, a very interesting uh, part uh, to, to study. And in the end uh, is that um, sequencing is a very powerful tool and very useful tool. But for some question, it's, it's not enough. Uh, for example, if you want to study this uh, interaction, uh, it's, it can be interesting to, to see actually how the organisms are actually interacting uh, physically, or, uh, but also sometimes mechanically. It can be interesting to do so. Yeah. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, and uh, to, just before acknowledging uh, people, we, uh, we just want to answer one question quickly that Shibu yeah. asked. Uh, I don't think they uh, took any large samples like plants to extract microbiome from that. It was just really small sampling and the largest one that was sampled was zoo, zooplankton. So nothing in the scale of uh, plant, like really huge samples. So. Uh, we could so we could not look at uh, uh, compare the microbiome in uh, seabeds and uh, compare it to that of soil microbiome. And another point that we did not talk about at all during this presentation, but is one of the things that we should remember Tara for as well, is that it had a huge like collaborative aspect, and there was a, a big art uh, side to it, uh, as we as Flora kind of uh, suggested at the beginning of the presentation. And they had a lot of communication going on around Tara and, and it, it was a very exciting and new way of doing science in the first place. Um, so that's also one of the take home messages for, for Tara as a, as a scientific initiative. Yeah, and also it was interesting to see labs that were not at all associated with Tara, but conducted, uh, used the data collected from Tara to do uh, some really cool metagenomic work. And uh, a lot of publications were uh, actually came from such labs too. Um, yeah, so now acknowledgements. Yeah. So thanks a lot to Ariel and Flora. So Ariel was our mentor uh, and he's the one who actually put us in touch with, uh, with Flora uh, for this uh, presentation. Um, yes, uh, both of those people helped us a lot uh, and Flora helped us like really understand what was going on and how it was to 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 be in this like uh, uh, initiative of science and her inputs on our understanding of the whole project were very much appreciated so thanks again mm -hmm. um and yeah that's it, that's it. uh on two projects unless and you have any questions yeah if people have questions so may maybe we should start with questions and then we go to project yes Congratulations. Thank you. Um, do you want to mention this uh, Flora's comment about the gut microbiome? Because that was uh, interesting, actually. Which? Why they, why, why they compare only to the gut micro microbiome? Because that was the only one available at that time, at 2015. Yeah. I can't find it, the comment. In the middle. Um, yeah. Other questions? You answer everything from the from the from the chat. Other questions that people have? Anybody? Maybe I can ask questions. So what? Maybe I missed on the beginning. So they were always collecting samples from the same depth. Uh, no. Not always. So the thing is, like the deep chlorophyll uh, maximum, it really mm -hmm. varies. Like the depth of the DCM varies from zone to zone. So they were always explicitly looking at uh, the, D the DCM and then they okay. sampled from various uh, places in the surface and mesopelagic and bathypelagic mm -hmm. zones. Okay, and maybe a question for, for Flora. Uh, to go deeper, you would need some special equipment that, that you didn't have? <laughs> Uh, yeah, for sure. If you want to go below the DCM, you're starting to get into very heavy equipment because you need several hundreds of meters of cable. And, uh, and Tara is just not a boat that, uh, that's tailored for that. So they basically tried to ask questions that they could answer with the means that they had. And, uh, and yeah, so it's too heavy uh, for that type of boat. Okay. 
And that was a thank you. Anybody else? So I, I have one uh, question. I, I was not clear about the the, the, the figures between the, the, the amount of the diversity or the amount of species in the ocean and in our gut. Oh, okay. Uh, because the it. graph that was shown somehow suggested it was not so different. Yeah, there are a lot of genes that are in common of the genes we know about. Um, no, I was not thinking uh, about this one, it was earlier in the study when they. Oh. Um, and things like this. Wait, uh, this one? No, no, it was, yes, this one. So in red, in red, it's the microbiome. Yeah. Yes, yeah. The gut so, microbiome. Yes. So it's five against 20. So only four times more uh, gene in the ocean compared to the. Uh, yes, but now that I think of it. I'm not sure anymore because if you look at the sorry, but if you look at the at the big graph, it goes up to forty million, but in the in the small graph it goes up to twenty million. So maybe there's something I, I think there's something I did not understand here because uh, yeah, it's not okay. matching. Because otherwise, uh, only four times more gene in the ocean compared to our gut would be surprising, no? I mean, we have um, almost the entire ocean in our guts then. What was the question again? Can you repeat? I, I did not understand. So, but also that's for OMRGC. So it's not, it's prior to Terra expeditions, this graph. No, but so in red, it's prior to Terra expedition, but in black, it's, uh, it's uh, with the Terra ocean data added. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but maybe I can find back the paper and look back at it to, to answer your question. Uh, but uh, um, but so also the, the thing that maybe uh, makes it less different between the two is that uh, here what they are plotting is the is not actually single genes, but it's reference genes. So it's uh, like a cluster of genes that, uh, like a reference gene actually is a kind of the, the consensus sequence of many genes that are very similar. Um, so I guess it reduces a bit like the, the final amount of genes. Um, but I will look back in the paper to, to have a, a, be a better answer to that. Nicola, uh, I just had a question. Uh, what exactly is being quantified quantified here, actually? In uh, this the, graph? the number of reference genes, depending on the amount of uh, of uh, combined samples. So let's say you pick up one sample and yeah. you have a certain set of reference genes. Yeah, and you have. And if, if those those genes are available in this sample. Can, can you repeat just the last part? Uh, so you have, you have a set of reference genes mm -hmm. and you're just comparing if those sets of reference genes are available in the sample or how is it? Uh, no. So what they did is that they, they took a sample. They looked at all the reference genes that were found in this sample. So let's say you have N, N reference genes. Okay. Then you take another sample, sample B. You look at how many reference genes you have in it. And then okay. you compare the two sets of reference genes and you just add the new genes that were not found in sample A. So you do a sample A plus a sample B minus what was found in sample B from sample A. Okay. So one way to think of it would be like if you were to cluster genes uh, based on similarity, it would be the number of clusters. Okay, but what what is the what do they want to see over here by clustering that gene exactly? Um, so the the clustering of gene is just um, kind of a way to group genes together to 
to make it easier to say something because um uh actually i'm not like, sure they're they're like cluster is the way to to understand it if you're not a, a biologist but like they would like to see gene similarity they did alignment um uh, amongst genes with a certain threshold to decide if a gene was close enough to its reference to be considered the same or if it was a different uh, gene and so like those uh, sequences that uh, would be considered matching are the reference genes i don't know if that's here oh. and, and just okay, maybe I mean... what what they wanted to show here is that um if you take um the, the the let's say you group the 249 uh, samples okay you have all the 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 unique genes that are like you, you keep all the unique genes that are inside these 249 samples and if you add another one like from somewhere else yes um you will not have so many new genes okay and so they, they use this uh, kind of curve to, to show that actually they sampled well uh, the diversity in the oceans. Because if you take a sample from another station somewhere else, it should yes. not increase so much uh, the, the diversity. I mean, the, 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 the number of genes. new genes. Yeah, the number of new genes because we already kind of reached a saturation point. Okay. Uh, Nicola? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, guys, my question is, uh, uh, why exactly, why did they compare uh, the clustering and these uh, rarefaction curves to gut microbiome? Because they were only com com comparing the clustering and the number of new genes there are, or are like the genes similar in some way? Um, here, they don't look at similarity between the two in this graph. So you mean to say like the genes uh, of the gut microbiome are similar to uh, species, plankton species of the oceans? No, no. In this graph, uh, what they're showing is that if you take several samples in the guts, mm -hmm. how the, how, um, let's say how fast you reach the, the, the a representative diversity of genes. Okay. So, uh, in terms of gut microbiome, like uh, the you reach it much quicker as compared to the plankton species. Um. So quicker. Quicker, I would say no. Mm -hmm. Uh. Bec I mean, maybe yeah, maybe a bit quicker. But what is really striking is the final uh, amount of uh, of genes retrieved. But uh, anyway, I think I need to, to look at this inner figure more because mm -hmm. uh, I don't yeah I don't um, I don't understand the y axis anymore if I compare it with the with, with the, the outer figure. figure yeah okay. so maybe I can go back to you and to to Manuel uh, after I read uh, more about it okay thanks any other questions. Or should we go back on the? So, so how do you prefer that you, you wanted to pr first present the project or I don't know whether it's easy that people leave and then come back. Uh, uh, I mean, they're going to come back anyways, right? Yes. So, so you, you prefer that you present the project and then they go and come back or they go in now and then. About, maybe it's better that the go like uh, that we all split now because yes okay okay so let's let's split all now so which means that everybody should go and in exactly 10 minutes you come back <laughs> exactly 10 so 4 30 everybody come back so you go to g2 channels discuss and come back in 10 minutes is it the old uh, group again yeah i think it's the best because i don't know how else to set up the channel so i think it's okay. the best you go in the in the in the well, it's not ideal, but it's the only thing we can do now, I think. Okay. And uh, Manuel, you are still here? Yes. You can unmute yourself. So we can stay with, uh, with the presenters once they, everybody yes. leaves. 
Go away, everyone. <laughs> go, go, go. I will put myself as well. Faces. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually um, we could uh, I think we could have keep the, the camera but it should have been working for yeah. thirty people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Good. So Mariella, you should go, Mariella, Dalila, Adia, Aditya. Go, go, go. They're not here, I think. <laughs> Oh, they're they're going away. Okay. Anyway, we can start the the debriefing. So, I think I've heard about this topic about. I mean, I think we have it every year almost. Oh yeah. <laughs> for yeah. me, it was for me for me it was the first one. And uh, and and it was by far the best one I've seen because the papers I know them the 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 science issue. It has been taken either for CARA or BIPSIN. And those papers are nightmares, I mean, to present. Because you see, these are big data. And it's about uh, lots of genomics. And the, the take-home message are quite complex, not easy to, to, to get. So in the end, it's very difficult to present. Yeah, the, usually, the bottom line is there is, big, there is a lot of data. Right? Yes, there is a lot of data. <laughs> and they, they discover a lot of diversity. And that's it. So, so, so I think honestly, you did a, a really an excellent job. So I'll point for you at the, the point, the, the thing that I think is very good, because I think it's something to keep in mind for your future presentation. So first, I think the intro session with questions, why should we do that? I think it's excellent way to start, because uh, that's, it put people already directly into the subject in a very personal way, so I think it's good. Uh, timeline was great as well because then we I mean in terms of zooming in zooming out I mean here it's already the exercise to, to, to put the big the big picture and uh, to show also the, the, the magnitude of the work and so on so that was good and also the amount of publication so right from the very beginning we knew we were on something big and I think it's important to capture people's attention like this try from the beginning to say okay we are not talking about a very focused subject it's a, a big thing so that was that was nice uh, ah yes one criticism when you introduce uh, plankton uh, there were no references so if i uh, interested in knowing more about this you said okay it's half of this uh, uh, that's of an interesting point because was, that number yeah, i want to know more and i was i was looking for the reference and there were no in in a bi bibliography synthesis lack of reference it's a problem, <laughs> but but that's that's one one small criticism. So I think it's excellent to take some time and using pictures to illustrate uh, because then it was very easy for people uh, to figure out to project themselves into the experimental work. It's really just a beginning, right? Because we don't understand much about what was found yet. And I think that it was a, a sort of a motivating time to go into such a project and it was a good, uh, good overview that you gave. I'm still curious to see where you took your project. Usually we debrief after the project. So I don't know if we'll have time to do it today, but I'm, I'm mainly, mainly curious to, to, to hear it out. We have something really interesting, Ariel. <laughs> I'm sure. All right. Any 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 feedback from your side? How was it to work in under the such conditions? Uh, how did you manage to coordinate, converge? Um, do you want to share anything? So it was. I forgot. Yes. Um, maybe maybe Diva just explain in few in few words what was the exercise that you were expected to to do because yeah. for those that are going to see this. Uh, one second, I'm trying to bring to, uh, so Should I start? Yes, you can start. Okay. So, um, hello everyone. And uh, we were basically supposed to 
uh, once we finished the Ripson uh, presentation, we were supposed to think of a project idea of uh, for the entire topic, like a, as a big project that we would uh, do to answer a new question or to solve uh, uh, or to give answer to an existing question that has not been answered. So here we propose like a small project that we thought we we would want to do for uh, our Ripson uh, project. And uh, it's basically, and uh, it's just a uh, work in progress. So please feel free to tell us what you think in the end. So we thought we will actually do an experimental project because a lot of uh, the results that we saw from the Tara is just meta-analysis and uh, genomics work, but uh, nothing has been seen in, uh, in reality. Like you have never, they have not looked at interactions in real time in a lab setting. So we thought we will do a co-culture project where the specific aims of our project would be to isolate and culture the organisms sampled in the Tara and other ocean expeditions. And uh, the second aim of our project is to, uh, is to replicate the ocean environment and to study the microbial interaction in a lab setting. Uh, and we wanted to do this in a high throughput manner, like they collected data in high throughput uh, manner. So this was the idea that we, uh, we thought we will do, where basically they collected samples and we thought we will dilute the samples with buffers and we will do droplet microfluidics where we will actually, the idea is to just put one cell in one droplet and uh, then look at the interaction between those two about which I'll talk uh, in, the, in the next few slides. And then in the end, maybe do 16S RNA sequencing to actually understand, uh, to know what the species is actually. Uh, so the main question that we're trying to answer is how can we unlock the uh, complexity of microbiome interactions? So for this, uh, imagine you have uh, five micro microorganisms isolated from the ocean. And then, so in, uh, originally the idea would be to actually, in, in the transition you will have all of them in the same way. And you will have uncontrolled growth and you will not be able to monitor anything in the data about the metabolic yeah. Thank you so much. I don't know if it's just me, but uh, it's, uh, okay. maybe you can repeat just this slide. You want me to go back? Uh, it's just that uh, we couldn't hear you well for this slide. So just if you can repeat this one. Oh, okay, yeah. And mainly everyone should be on mute except for you. So, okay. In, in, in the convention method, typically what we would do is we will have all the bacteria in the same test tube and there will be uh, uncontrolled growth and we will not be able to get an, a, a conclusive data from, uh, from, the, uh, from the samples that we originally have. So for this, we propose this automated platform for microbial co-culture where what we want to do is imagine you have these five microbes and you, you want to you encapsulate them in uh, droplets uh, and make emissions and you can do this in large scale because you're doing it in a microfluidics chip uh, and then you, the chip will look somewhat like this and the only things that can oh, one second. You have you yeah as I said uh, you can do this uh, put them inside the uh, uh, inside the droplet and then what we want to do is we want to get uh, a floor we want we will tag them using fluorescence so we'll put fluorescent tag to each bubble and once that is done you can actually look at uh, each of them and you can map them to see which bubble corresponds to which color or whatever then this will be the microfluidic uh, device in which you're growing everything and then you will have uh, say these five bubbles that are there and bacteria can actually replicate within this so then what you want to do is you can actually monitor real time growth uh, of all of this and take OD for each one of them, each one. And when you're actually injecting them, you sort of maintain some distance between the bubbles just to make sure that you, ca you capture the uh, signal from just that uh, particular uh, microorganism that is present in that bubble. And uh, once that is done, what we propose to do is so this is the only thing that will happen then basically the only the droplets can only exchange molecules the bacteria will not come out of it so by doing this uh, we propose that we can we can actually centrifuge it and do mass spec and we look at uh, microbiome interactions 
and uh, by doing this we can actually make like heat chat heat map like this where we try out different uh, combinations of bacteria in our microfluidic strip we don't know what bacteria that is for which we propose we will do 16s but we definitely will know from the mass spec about the metabolites that it is releasing so if i say have only bacteria a i can make a list of all the metabolites it's releasing so if i have droplets with bacteria a and b then again i will make a list of all the things that are that are being released and also the concentration of it and uh, by doing this you can look at interactions between uh, microbes and uh, this will basically give a, a very stable and real time monitored growth and it can give us conclusive data about uh, the metabolite exchanges between microbes so uh, this is what we thought we'll do for our project uh and this is just a uh, work in progress so please feel free to uh, tell us what you think about it i'm sure there are lot uh, there, there can be there's lot of room for improvement but uh, yeah. if i if i maybe also can add something um it was also like we wanted to do this because you, we have many species that uh for which we don't know how to culture them in 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 lab in the lab because uh, the the media uh, the medium that are being used are not appropriate for it and so we were thinking that maybe uh you had some obligatory um interactions that were needed for, for these uh bacteria to grow and we were hoping that if we had several combinations of different bacteria we would able by looking at the growth rate to find which combinations are are necessary for a specific species to grow and so if we extract the metabolite then we'd be able like maybe to add it uh, in the medium of culture and so we could grow this uh, this bacteria alone any questions any questions what uh, some uh, wait, uh, i'm not able to see the chat one second yeah are these water in oil droplets how will molecules cross the wa uh, water oil barrier so okay so uh, this is from basically a paper that i was reading earlier from this lab of uh, um, i keep forgetting this name okay if i remember, he works in equal polytechnic I, uh, yeah charles burrow so they do this emulsion oil emulsion uh, uh, droplet uh, uh, micro microfluid uh, thing where they manage to put in individual cells like one cell in one droplet and they have they, and uh, they have actually seen that uh, um, molecules are being exchanged between the droplets so i don't really uh, know how the molecules uh, uh, cross the water a uh, water oil barrier but they have characterized this and uh, this has been done before where active compounds are known to uh, leave uh, uh, cross the barrier and just communicate Divya, I I don't know in the Charles Barrow's setup whether they I think they 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 wash out the oil in one point. I'm not sure, but I think they do. What uh, what Daniela? Can you repeat? I, I'm not sure. So you are mentioning the Charles Barrow setup. So I don't know whether it's really the the the, the water oil barrier. I I don't know. I think in one point they get rid of oil. Ah okay. I don't know. Maybe we should check up this, but I. I will check this. But Manuel's point. Manuel's point of how do you cross the barrier? I think it's valid point. Okay, but I remember reading this, so I can get back to you. Uh, I will. Okay. Okay. And an answer to Lara about the centrifugation step is to isolate the um, microbes from the metabolites, and uh, analyze only the metabolites to understand how they interact. Santa, you had a question? Uh, no, I just had a comment because uh, my lab is doing a collaboration with Charles Burrow and supposedly it, it, it is crossing, the molecules are crossing because what we do uh, within the collaboration is that we monitor um, how um, uh, chemotherapeutic drugs can cross uh, the droplets and get into, this, uh, get into the droplets and add, directly interact with the cells. So it, it actually works. The can I ask a question for for you? For me? Yeah. <laughs> sure. I, just uh, tell me if you know. Um, I, I was just wondering if uh, any kind of molecule can can cross uh, this uh, this uh, droplet barrier. 
or if you have any specific kinds of, of molecules that are crossing because in our project we're wondering that maybe we would only like we uh, let's say we'll be looking only at metabolites that can cross uh, this uh, this um, uh, oil barrier uh, but maybe so we'll miss some of uh, in important metabolites that cannot cross it but that still uh, um, like uh, support interactions between two different species um, your question to my understanding is what kind of molecules can cross the barrier right yeah if, if you have certain types of molecule that can cross and other that cannot or if like it has been seen that almost all molecules can cross oh i i honestly can't answer to, to you uh in that in such detail because what we did is uh, very specifically to chemotherapeutic drugs uh specifically uh five a few so i i can't answer you this question to you uh currently I, I don't know in case i don't know i don't know yet <laughs> maybe i can check and get back to you but i don't know <laughs> yeah, that's I, fine Read and uh, get back to you, Nicola. Sorry. No, I said I will also read. I do. I definitely remember reading uh, about this that my, uh, molecules can cross, but I don't. I don't remember reading about what kind of molecules can actually cross. Okay. Uh, supposedly, they use uh, the fluorinated oil, so that the, they don't really. I, I don't think that they mentioned uh, that they have this threshold of what molecules can cross, but. Apparently, a bunch of molecules when using this chlorinated oil can cross, so, yeah. Uh, from the questions, you have Valerie and then Elif, people who raise hands. So, Valerie. Um, so, I just wanted to make sure that I understand the, the premise of the setup. You want to separate the species so that they can interact by exchanging metabolites. Yeah, that's the idea. So what do you qualify as a successful interaction? Because I can imagine that a bacterial colony inside a droplet can just start secreting metabolites and it could even pass to, uh, to adjacent droplets. But that doesn't mean that those metabolites are actually being taken up and used by the second micro. So what would you qualify as a successful interaction? Uh, I, I think what we are trying to do is uh, uh, to be very uh, to be more precise is just look at interaction between two different uh, droplets and uh, say if droplet a has species a and droplet b has species b that's what we are interested in understanding and and so just to to add up to to Dija's answer uh, so if we beforehand if we characterize the growth rate of the species individually and uh, if we compare it to the growth rate of the species when they are uh, like uh, in pairs with another bacterial species we can determine actually what is the effects of the presence of this species to the growth rate of uh, of species a yeah so like a successful interaction would be if species a grows better like if we if we don't see species a when it's not close to the species B, then we know that A and B interaction is beneficial to A. Okay, but then cycling back to what Nicola ended up with uh, after Divya spoke, which I thought was gonna be the bottleneck in this project, is that you still require a successful growth of each individual bacterial species. And no, we, we require the growth of some of them. And then if those that grow alone interact in a beneficial way to the other ones, we can grow the other ones. You can't grow the other ones. You see what I mean? You said that you'd be able, if, you, if these bacteria have to interact within a community for them to grow, you can overcome the culturing limit that we have with when we have these metagenomic projects and we can't culture half of these things in the lab. But this, there's still a requirement to be able to create valid growth conditions for the microbes you see what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. um yeah so, go for it if you, if you want to no, i i i'm just thinking uh, i think yeah valley that is really true we need, we, we need to do that we really need to grow them at some point to uh, do this and uh, a very lame answer would be to uh, by the time we do this project we expect someone to actually culture ocean bacteria and make media for it and we'll use that 
uh, that would be a very long answer but uh, yeah that step needs to be really included in the project like isolation and growth in uh, media but and the um, left very sophisticated yeah. very cool just, uh, i was thinking also so we know that uh, for example um i had uh, uh, an example in mind where um I, for example, in, in the lab, I'm currently doing my internship uh, to grow um, dinoflagellates. What they're doing is that uh, they tried first to, to create their uh, artificial medium using um, so distilled water and the artificial, uh, or I think it was a sterilized uh, sea salt um, and, and other compounds, and it, it was never growing. And so the way they, they, they kind of... Um, called the, the issue is that they were collecting seawater in the oceans and then they were filtering it with um, 0 0.22 micrometer uh, micrometers filters and were using it to grow the cells and they were seeing a little growth compared to no growth before so it's it was encouraging but what i want to to say is that um uh i think we can use raw samples and since we will separate all, all the cells from the samples and then we can like take some of these um, of these drops and put them in, in presence of uh, organisms that we identified as uh, let's say lonely growers mm. I don't know if it could uh, like solve the issue I, I was thinking it could solve the issue Okay, we have a few more questions because we should move also to the other projects. Yaliv and Laura. Laura, do you want to comment something? Yeah, I have a quick question. Yeah, but also Elif was before me. Go, Elif. Oh, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I have a question about your setting. Uh, in case the uh, bacteria you'll collect are anaerobes, do you think you'll be able to grow them in your setting, in your microfluidic device? That's a good question. Question. <laughs> yeah. uh -huh. We didn't thought much about it. Uh, so good question. Do you have anaerobic bacteria in the ocean? I don't know. Yeah, I think they are not so common. It depends on the on the on the um, pelagic zone, I guess. Uh, yeah. Because the oxygen availability is not the same, but you have dissolved uh, dissolved oxygen. Um, yeah. But I think you can find them if you yeah, go yeah, to you the ocean floor. Them. Yeah, yeah. But even I, I was thinking that sometimes you had like um, you have very specific uh, uh, setups where one species um, uh, gets dominant in the ecosystem and it pumps uh, all the 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 oxygen or nutrients available for other organisms and so maybe in such a situation you you have a, a, like anaerobic bacteria can be favored and so maybe you'll find them more um, but yes we, we did not thought, yeah, we did not think, think about it uh, okay so, thank you thanks I'm um, just quickly on what you said. I mean, there are some bacteria that um, survive on methane, mm -hmm. but they are basically they are living on the soil. So I don't know if that would be relevant for your experiment. But I wanted to ask, um, why is it so important for you to have just single bacteria in the droplets? And why don't you start with bigger populations? And then instead of droplets, for example, within... Um, some devices that have nanopore filters. Yeah, uh, okay, that, that would be really interesting. But the initial thought was that uh, we want to really understand how individual bacteria communicate uh, as to see how you get these collective actions that you observe uh, in the ocean. So this was, this primarily was designed to do that. But with what you are suggesting, if you have, again, uh, small, commu including small communities of bacteria, even if it's just two species, uh, uh, two or more species, I think it's just uh, too messy to understand uh, which bacteria is releasing what. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the idea behind this. Okay, okay thank you. Okay, 
so it's it's already late five maybe should we present the the projects by groups yeah, yeah. thank you guys it was very good which group one? maybe everybody can turn on microphones now it's okay uh and then cameras Who will be the first one to okay. Your home is in fire, Valerie. <laughs> and Rachel is in fire. Yeah, it's not working now. <laughs> I just find it. It's meant to be this background, but okay. Okay, it's not working. <laughs> So, who wants to who present? Starts? Yeah. <laughs> Valerie. <laughs> Valerie, should we go? Yeah. Lara will be presenting for our group, and it was Lara, Sorin, Shubham, and Anaditya, and I. Go ahead. Valerie, you are me. Okay, no, I think it makes more sense for you to go first because you always speak to the expedition and then I'll Okay, so um, what we've been thinking of um, for this project, what you presented, also it was a really nice presentation, thank you. Um, so what would be the next step of Tara or how could we actually extend this great project? And one of the limitations was the um, sample size and the sample collection. So we were thinking maybe we could make use of the general ocean traffic that is already existing and equipping some boats that are traveling regularly to actually collect more samples. Um, and that would so increase the sample size, it would increase the sample points of collection. And also we would like to overcome the seasonal buyers to see because you said that the temperature is actually the best indicator of the most important parameter when it comes to diversity in plankton. Um, so what about the seasonal change and then how can we link that actually to the climate change and how this makes a difference. And also one nice point would be if it's possible to equip some boats just from a more um, social part to raise awareness to say okay some boats that are actually just linked to industry have also play also a part for science and um, the community. Yeah. And then we were also thinking that we have this rich sequence database that's being generated from all the sampling and they've created lots of really cool databases and genomic databases. Um, but obviously you see that there's always a percentage of genes that are uncharacterized or unclassified. So we thought that to have kind of a, a functional benefit from this data and these sequences that were that were sequenced is to have a, a large scale screening project um, where people could decide on what their particular functionality of choice is. For instance, if you want to screen for antibiotics and you could create cDNA libraries of some of the inner sequence in that space that they've found and then you can screen it for specific activities in this case, antibiotic resistance, or you could screen it for metabolism of other things. Um, for instance, this is probably how they found some of the, the plastic degrading enzymes by creating these large libraries and screening them for function. Yeah, that's what we think. Thank you. Right. I think, Nicola, we hear you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lara, Sirin, Shubham. Uh, for our uh, project, uh, our team was me, was Elif, was uh, Rachel, and uh, and Santa. Yeah. Uh, so our project is uh, first of all, I want to thank you for the very interesting uh, topic. Uh, second of all, here is our project. Uh, we want to collect microorganisms from bigger depths of, of the ocean, free microorganisms and the ones living with larger hosts. The purpose is to understand microbiome population composition and the evolution of the biodiversity of these communities. 
Thank you for coming to my TED talk. <laughs> you do many TED talks. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, actually, if if you are interested, I, I just um, came across a, a guy that called. I think his name is Zobel, and he's known kind of uh, being um, an expert in uh, deep sea micro microbes. Uh, yeah. So if you, if you are really interested in this, uh, does he have a podcast or something? <laughs> <laughs> I guess not, but uh, but I think he uh, his papers might be quite cool. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Uh, what was his name? Zobel. Z O B E two L. And his name is Claude Ephraim. Claude what? Ephraim. Ephraim. Hey, okay, how do you cool. spell an F Ephraim? <laughs> Wait, uh, I'm going to. to Maybe if you write it in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, Nicola. Great. Who's next? You can select randomly. Nobody wants to volunteer. Who is the next? Um. Uh, okay, yeah. I will talk on behalf of my group. So, okay. uh, Thank you, we have Catherine, Kamel, Dalala, Rodrigo, uh, Tamara, and Sweetie. And we were thinking of um, actually work, uh, characterizing different tools that we use for clustering uh, and to have a better tool for these analyses that you talked about. So, we're thinking why not just do a test on all of that with some. Uh, uh, really well studied data set and see which tool would actually give a high throughput in, in like lesser time time frame uh, to have more robust tools for uh, such experiments later. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. All right, and we have one last group of whom? Um, maybe Catherine? No, Catherine is in the same as Sweekriti, I think. Do we do we have? Yeah, yes. uh, hello. Oh, yeah. 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 So um, our group, we were actually uh, very interested in uh, what uh, what are the different microbes that are present in different uh, sea levels, and uh, we wanted to see how this affects the microbiome of the organisms that are present in that sea level. Mm. Very cool. Wow. Interesting. So, um, if you are uh, so, we wanted to start right at this, uh, right at the seabed. So first, you know, you have these um, deep sea seabed uh, plants. So mm. they have a certain root microbiome. So we wanted to compare the root microbiome of the sea plants with the uh, root microbiome of the plants in the land. That was one. Then we wanted to look at different organisms um, at different sea levels, since we already. I mean, I don't know if we already have that uh, thing, but if we don't have it, we'll do it. So we pick up different sea levels at one specific point and uh, isolate the micro microorganisms, whatever are there. And then we pick up one random organism and then we see, um, you know, how much of, uh, how much of that uh, contributes to the microbiome of that specific organism and how much of that microbiome actually contributes to the development or you know the functions okay. of the organisms so, so, so you're is, speaking is there is there uh, as you as you go uh, from the bottom of the ocean to the top uh, is there any change in the level of uh, microbiome involvement in organisms 
Okay. So, so you just uh, to, to make uh, to make things clear, you, you're me you're mentioning uh, macroorganisms, the microbiome of macroorganisms. Yes, microbiome okay. of macroorganisms. Okay. Wow, that's uh, actually yeah, <laughs> it's a yeah. really cool question. And also another thing we suggested is to look and compare the different microbiome of the of the fish for example that eat uh, the plants in the water to the herbivores that live on the like in the terrestrial part to see if there's a common part or not because the microbiome is thought to have like a play a main role in the nutrition of the animal as well so maybe they also share a greater core than those that are carnivores for example or fish that eat other fish Hmm. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Very good. All right. So I guess that's Thanks the end of Vipsin. Mm -hmm. so that's the end of Vipsin. Yes.